G'day everyone and welcome to my Anzac Portrait Series. I'm artist Wayne Dowson and this is a portrait of 97 year old World War II veteran, Charles Wallace. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy part two of our interview with Mr. Charles Gilmore Wallace. At that time I was working as a, an armourer with the Defence Department and uh, they, uh, they then claimed me back into the civilian job because I was a protected industry. And I'm still trying to think how I could get into AIU. So the next thing that came along was the, we were offered uh, a job in the, we were offered uh, enlistment in the regular forces. Now they were quite different to the AO. The regular forces were Australia bound and whereas the AOF as you we know went overseas. Uh, so I took that opportunity and with this I could see that that was a permanent job. It involved superannuation. I could see that there was a protection there for the family. So I took that job. I was then posted to Liverpool, where I worked in one of the workshops up there. While we were up there, the, the CEO of the workshops uh, was a man that was determined to keep his staff. And we got uh, several officers to, offers to go to the AAF, but um, he put the kibosh on that and it killed every chance that came up. Well, very unfortunately for him, he had to go to hospital and another chap took over his position. And this chap had already been offered the job of a, 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 a workshop to take to Malaysia. So he came out and saw us and said he is still interested in the AIF. Well, I think we nearly killed him with the joy. <laughs> he made the suggestion to us and uh, the, we were taken down to the engineer's depot at Moor Park where we were enlisted into the army. One of the uh, funny parts of that enlistment was that uh, uh, the, uh, I went into one doctor who was examining my eyesight and uh, I went to sit in the chair where I could read the eye chart and he said, no, 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 I know you young fellas. <laughs> you're not going to trick me that way, come over here. So he took me over to the window and from there we could see onto the showgrounds in Sydney. And of course it was being used as a, a military camp at that stage. And he said, what can you see over there? And I said, I can see a number of tents. Uh, as a matter of fact, from where I'm standing, I can see 10 tents. Oh yes, what else can you see? And my knowledge of military uh, uh, procedures came into hand very well. And I said, well, there's uh, uh, six um, people in that tent. Each of them have got a stretcher. And on the stretcher, and I explained how the blankets were laid out. And their equipment was laid on the... And he said, nothing wrong with your side, son. I don't think I never turned around him and said, "Well, it all comes from memory, not from my side." <laughs> anyway, we got into the AIF, and uh, we went off to um, uh, I went back up to Liverpool. The work we were doing up there was maintenance of equipment, and this was uh, I found out that I'd entered the what we term the non-combatant side of the army. We were the ones that did the maintenance of the equipment and it was like other groups that uh, one looked after the transport, others looked after the feeding and this sort of thing. The army was divided up that way. Ours was the maintenance of the equipment and uh, as an armourer one of the jobs I had was a, a team of of uh, some uh, 10 chaps and uh, <clears throat> we used to go through the business of uh, r r repairing particularly the rifles and then we would test those in a, an enclosed range. Uh, that was uh, a 30, 33 
uh, foot range and the whole thing was enclosed and you put the rifle into what they called an infield rest and you could set it up rigidly in that and then you would do your adjusting of your sights in that so that if the person aimed at a spot here you didn't hit over there. Uh, that um, had one disadvantage was there being an enclosed base and such things as protection for your ears were not heard of and most of us who worked in those conditions suffered hearing problems mm. uh, later on in life. Uh, that went on until of course came time for embarkation. Uh, we uh, set off by train from Liverpool and we came through to uh, Darling Harbour. Then we were put onto barges and taken out to the the uh, transports would be to go. Our transport happened to be the Queen Elizabeth. Now the Queen Elizabeth had been commenced in Glasgow or in Scotland and uh, <coughs> when war broke out the, um, the risk of her being bombed was so high that she was taken over to the States and uh, um, the, if things were brought up to a seaworthy stage and then she came out to Australia and we were the first troops to go aboard. We were rather lucky because uh, being a workshop unit uh, we then went to work on things we could do to improve the conditions on the, uh, the, on the Queen Elizabeth. One of the um, uh, things we used to do was to, we did, connected up the air conditioning system through to all the public rooms. Uh, that for some reason or other they didn't allow us to uh, uh, put the, uh, the through to the cabins, but the public rooms were air conditioned. And the other thing was the, uh, uh, the lifeboats on the bed, once we got to sea, were all, they were all swung out into the lowering position. And uh, we used to go around to each of these boats and then service the engines in those so that if we did have a need, everything was ready to go. And I can tell you, getting across from the deck of the boat to the end of the lifeboat and you look down there, you know, you seem to be 20 feet up in the air or more and the water rushing down under there, there was quite a sight. The convoy consisted of five ships. There was the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary, uh, the New Amsterdam, <coughs> the Ile de France and one other ship. Uh, they were all uh, Atlantic liners in their normal uh, uh, course of travel. Therefore, it was a fair, it was a fast convoy right through. We travelled most of the time at round about 20 knots. Uh, when we left Sydney, <coughs> we went well south of Tasmania and came up into the uh, Great Australian Bight and. Uh, <clears throat> there we struck uh, perhaps the worst weather we had uh, we experienced in the whole of the, the trip. Got out into the Indian Ocean. There the convoy separated and some of the ships went to um, uh, Singapore while the rest of us went on to the Middle East. The exercises for the trip, when I tell you exercises, physical exercises to maintain the fitness of the individuals. And um, we also had shooting practice, you know, you'd throw um, um, articles into the water and the chaps would practice rifle fire and things of that nature. And uh, then the um, uh, sports was another activity. Uh, the, um, the officers always arranged some sort of sporting activity to keep the, uh, well, to kill the monotony, really. One of the um, important things that happened on that 
the chaps were writing letters and of course censorship was in full swing. And the, uh, the warrant officers and uh, junior officers, captains and lieutenants, always had the job of censoring the, the letters. Uh, the thing that always impressed me was that uh, you were reading the innermost thoughts of the chaps that were writing them. Detail that um, of their family life that, you know, was meant for no one else but the husband and wife or the boy and the girlfriend. And um, the um, my, my great uh, joy with that was that at never at any occasion was there an incident where anybody betrayed the trust that was put in them to, in censoring those letters. I always think that was a great a uh, great uh, tribute to the people that did this sort of work. Um, our first port of call on the way was Trincomalee in Ceylon or Sri Lanka as it's now known. And uh, that was, uh, by this time, there was just the Elizabeth and the, uh, uh, the Mary left in the convoy. The rest had gone off to Singapore. We pulled into the harbour there and Trincomalee, when we were there, was a, a lovely harbour. It's a big harbour, narrow entrance. Uh, where as you go into the port itself, you could swear that you could throw a cricket ball from the, uh, uh, the boat to the shore. And uh, we anchored in there and then we started to take in the, the uh, view. Now, Trincomalee was mainly a naval base at that stage and uh, we went in there for fuel and uh, supplies, uh, which were supplied by the British occupancy. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, when you looked from the ship to the surrounding side, there was this lovely greenery of uh, the the foliage round the water's edge, and that came right down to the water's edge. And then every now and again, you would get the uh, uh, the burst of either purplish or reddish blooms of the poinsettias and different types of trees that grew through the thing. It really made a lovely sight. The other interesting part from that was that when we came in, there wasn't a building to be seen anywhere. It was all hidden by the foliage. And yet, we'd hardly dropped anchor than the boat was surrounded by um, um, these little boats with locals, uh, local inhabitants in it, and they had all sorts of things to sell. There were um, items that uh, they'd been mentioned, like uh, statues of elephants and uh, <clears throat> other animals, uh, the fruit, and uh, um, uh, uh, they used to do some very neat handy work with needles <clears throat> and like uh, 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 table runners and things like that were they were available for sale. Uh, we left Trincomalee and uh, then went straight through to Port Tufik in Egypt and then we even moved off and taken to <coughs> a transit camp where we awaited until the train that was taking us to our destination. We travelled for some three and a half hours in that train to eventually we got to a place called Tel El Kabir. We were disembarked there and taken to the uh, our campsite. Uh, for the period we were there, we operated uh, two workshops. Now the the workshops were designed to cover all military equipment. Now we had things like the Bren gun carrier. We serviced those, we serviced the, all of the uh, artillery that the army was using. We had rifles, machine guns, revolvers, that sort of thing. 
and uh, that was looked after. Um, they, uh, the recuperators on guns require very strict surroundings, no dust, uh, air temperature within the room in which they're being repaired. Um, and that, of course, required the uh, same sort of artificers to look after them. Uh, we had a carpenter shop, a plumber's shop, and um, they, they were able to do anything uh, that the uh, look after maintain anything that the army used. The thing that I found very interesting was the ingenuity of the individuals you had there, you know, it didn't matter what the problem was, there was always somebody that could come up with an answer to it. And uh, we were able to keep the equipment that we serviced in order very, very well. There were also funny incidents happened in that. In the vehicle section, <clears throat> Because they were taking gearboxes and differentials out of vehicles and there was always oil in these components, you had to do something to uh, cope with the oil on the floor. And the method of doing that was to use the sawdust from the carpenter shop and spread that on the floor. And that was um, uh, in the early morning before we started work the locals used to come in, they would sweep that into a heap and then it would be put in a truck and taken away and disposed of. This particular day, the heap had been gathered into the workshop and either spontaneous combustion or a cigarette butt had been thrown into it and it caught fire. Now, it wasn't a blaze, it was more or less a smoulder and with the oil, a lot of smoke. And uh, it wasn't long before most of the workshop was, you know, just about blacked out with the smoke from this smouldering sawdust. One of the sergeant majors there uh, yelled out to one of the privates, uh, Smithy, get a fire extinguisher. So Smithy disappeared to get the fire extinguisher and he was gone for a heck of a long while. Eventually he appeared through the gloom of the smoke and instead of a fire extinguisher he's got a great bulk of timber over his shoulder. The sergeant major says, where's the bloody fire extinguisher? What's that bulk of wood doing on your shoulder? I can't find a fire extinguisher, sergeant major, but this will keep it going until I do. <laughs> the sergeant major was not amused. We eventually um, served our period of time over there and um, by this time the uh, Japanese had entered the war and uh, we left the camp and um, went aboard the Mauritania and we were settled down into the ship. Now again Officers and warrant officers and sergeants had cabins, they were allocated to cabins. And uh, <clears throat> the diggers went into holes where they had bunks, One, uh, they, they were usually um, three-tier bunks. Um, the uh, Mauritania sailed on the 31st of January and uh, we travelled through to Bombay where we arrived on uh, uh, the 6th of February 1942. On the um, 13th of February, we embarked on a ship called the City of Paris. First of all, we were supposed to go to Java. And then during the course of the sailing, uh, or the period we were at sea, um, the uh, Japanese had really started to get into um, um, Singapore and it was quite obvious that Java was not a place for us so it was then decided that the um, uh, stepsister flight troops would go up to Burma and join the British Army up there. 
At that stage, uh, Curtin, who was the Prime Minister, uh, discovered that, uh, th that this was the intention for the uh, Australian troops and he got in touch with Churchill and I believe the discussions between uh, those two was rather torrid and Curtin won his way and it was decided to bring the um, Australian troops back to Australia. Now, <clears throat> we finished up uh, while the, um, it was a decide of what they were going to do when they got us back to Australia, that we would go to Singapore. And uh, <clears throat> we finished up by uh, uh, getting the, um, uh, into Singapore on the 25th of February. Now the rather interesting thing about this is that most people talk about 13 as an unlucky number. Uh, we started off by sailing on Friday the 13th of February. We were 13 ships in the convoy, we were 13 days at sea, and instead of finishing up as a guest of the Japanese Emperor, we finished up in a British isle by the name of Sri Lanka, or Colombo as it was then. We eventually left Colombo we sailed on the, the 1st of March and that stage we went straight back to uh, Australia. Any rate, from <clears throat> there we, uh, we moved with our equipment up to Musselbrook, New South Wales. And there we set up our workshop on the property of a family called Hunter Bowman. We, we then got to uh, Cairns and uh, we then uh, went by train up to the Atherton Tablelands. Then eventually finished our time up there and uh, the time came to go to New Guinea. Uh, we finished up by going down by train uh, to Townsville and there we embarked on a ship and was set off for Moresby. We got to Moresby and we finished up going out to a place called the Nine Mile out there where we set up our workshop <clears throat> and again we had uh, uh, the equipment of the army to look after in maintenance purposes. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> when they got out there again the ingenuity of the digger came to the foresight. For uh, and they found they went found that there was a lot of dumps there, particularly with aircraft parts. So the chaps used to go out there, and they would get the perspex from the wrecked aircraft and the propellers. And uh, <clears throat> what they used to do with them, they make a shape of an aeroplane, uh, and it would be a copy of a of a, 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 a current fighting plane or a bomber and uh, they would mount that on a standard and then with the, um, um, the um, section of the propeller they would scoop that out and make an ashtray out of that. Then around the edges of it they would etch uh, the, uh, a scene, uh, perhaps the 5th US Air Force or some unit like that. Now when they made these up, they were quite an attractive ashtray. You had this beautifully polished thing with the um, writing round the side and the arm with the aeroplane on top of it. Uh, they're quite good jobs. Uh, one of the things that really interested me was that the American officers in particular were very keen to get hold of Japanese swords. And of course, these weren't a very common item. So the diggers got the bright idea that they could manufacture these swords. So they got the leaf, <laughs> the leaf of, a, of a mainspring and uh, <clears throat> heated that and shaped it up into the sword type, made the fittings to it, you know, like the hilt and that sort of thing. And they made a very good replica of the Japanese officer's sword. And then somebody said to them, now, 
there's one thing you've got to remember. These swords under the hilt have the history of the sword. Oh, how do we get over that? So they got hold of a Japanese uh, manual and got the artists in the show to etch something out of the book. And uh, <clears throat> this was duly made and of course it was the last auction at the theatre this particular night and a young American officer bought it and I don't know what he paid for it but it was quite a considerable sum. And then he, he wanted to send to his parents. So he took it to the eye people, intelligence people in his unit and said, interpret this for me. So he, he, he went back several times and apparently they said, oh, he's uh, uh, not, uh, uh, we're having a bit of trouble with this. And eventually he came in and he said, what's the problem? And they said, well, the best we can get out of this is not to exceed 500 roofs per minute. <laughs> <laughs> After about two months in New Guinea, um, I was then reposted to the Finch Haven area. We went on until uh, we got to... Uh, uh, we, we found, first of all, we came across a... Um, um, a bamboo hut and uh, when we looked into this hut it had been a uh, hospital for Japanese soldiers and uh, that was rather a ga ghastly sight. The Japanese had walked away and they would left the, the injured Japanese in their uh, bunks in this place. Um, They'd either died of natural causes, but by the time we got there, half the corpse had been eaten away by crabs and uh, not a very pleasant sight at all. It also gave us an idea into the, um, the way the Japanese soldier lived. If he wasn't a fighting man and fit, then he was useless and that was the sort of thing that they, uh, they left for him. Later on we got out to, we found a couple of these dumps and um, what we did was to take the projectile from the cartridge case and then uh, the propellant was taken from the case and we put that in a stack until we, we had a stack about a metre high of just the explosive in there. And we couldn't leave that, so we decided to uh, burn it. So we set up a, a ring of uh, cordite round the area and a fuse running back. And we got well back from that and uh, set the fuse alight. Well, it burned merrily down. It got to the trail we'd left round there and that started to burn uh, very gently. And uh, as the heat increased, so the flame became, well, and all of a sudden it got the explosive stage and the thing went boom. Well, I thought we'd blown New Guinea up. <laughs> um, I had about uh, uh, three months, four months over there on that tour of duty. And then I got recalled to Moresby as the unit was going back to Australia. We came back by ship to Townsville and uh, then we again by train back up to the Atherton Table Inn. And I was there when the war finished. To end my story, I started my life as a private in the army and uh, when I finished my service at Victoria Barracks in Paddington I'd reached the exalted rank of Major. It was a very, very interesting period of my life.